she's gonna tell us how to use the force, or wait, the forces of alignment to uh, make your architecture aligned with your teams. Please join me in welcoming Adam. G'day. Uh, yes. I'll, uh, I think this is my second live talk in front of an audience uh, since the, 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 the great shutdowns and, and everything like that. And I'm still kind of, it takes me a little while to warm up, so just bear with me a little bit. Um, yeah, my, my talks like this tend to be just a, a, a big grab bag of, of things that I find interesting along the way um, uh, that hopefully you find interesting, roughly strung together with a, a, a little bit of narrative. We should have plenty of time for questions on the end, um, so, so definitely um, yeah, save up any questions or, or tell me why it will never work and uh, what's wrong with all of my ideas. Um, a little bit about me. So um, this is one of my uh, favorite photos. Uh, this is my, my son, uh, Jack, who's, who's 20, uh, and I, we ride a tandem mountain bike, uh, Jack's special needs. Uh, and so we get around the, the, the forest in central Victoria on the gravel, and we have an absolute ball. And what I particularly like about this is the, um, a little bit of tandem bicycle trivia, which is the person on the front of a tandem is called the captain, and the person at the back is called Stoker. That has absolutely nothing to do with my talk. I just like it, and I thought you might like to know. Um, so my background, uh, I, uh, you know, I, in a distant past, I would have called myself a, a full-time you know, software engineer, software developer, uh, and tech lead. Um, uh, and, but over, over time, I've grown into, into being, kind of taking on bigger tech lead roles and tech leadership for programs and big technology strategy roles and things like that. Um, uh, many years ago, more years than I kind of care, care to think, I was able to uh, join a company called ThoughtWorks, uh, and uh, I did uh, nearly 15 years of consulting for ThoughtWorks, um, which was an absolutely fantastic experience. I got to, to work across um, many companies, all based here in Melbourne, and um, meet a lot of people from all over the world and think about, you know, big technology concepts and, and um, you know, software architecture and, and things like that. Uh, and I got the, the privilege of, of, of being part of the ThoughtWorks Global Tech Advisory Board and produce things like the, the, the technology radar and, and sort of input a few ideas back into the community around um, things like uh, you know, uh, APIs and event-driven architectures and um, Conway's law and, and the sort of dynamics of software. And it's always been a, a sort of big, fascinating thing for me. Um, and, and now, um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I, I left ThoughtWorks and uh, I took on a role as the head of architecture at NYIB. And if you'd known me 15 years ago, you'd think that's bloody hilarious because architect was the absolute kind of the, the evil title, the, the people that you bump into the organization who were absolutely useless and did nothing and just talked big, big talks. But I think um, you know, the, the role of architecture has kind of evolved in that time. And I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, uh, more able now in my role to apply these big concepts of, of, um, of software design and architectural design in what I do every day at NYB. And I've been having a, having a ball. And um, it's been a lot harder than I thought it would be. Uh, that's for sure. But I was talking a little bit about ThoughtWorks and some of those big ideas. And, for several years, I've been a little bit like this. I've been looking at all these grand ideas that have been around and, and thinking of them and developing in my head this, I haven't written it down, but this grand unifying theory of software architecture. And we've had these ideas of domain-driven design, which is really, really old, like, you know, uh, from my, you know, early in my career, but such a big resurgence in the last few years. And DevOps, just another, like, yeah, it's getting old and old, old now, but the, that concept of, of, you know, you build it, you run it, and developing, um, you know, no separate operations teams, microservices, cloud, platform thinking, event-driven, these things that come together and they reinforce and they support each other and they, they um, feel like they're coming together to create a big leap forward. And it's been coming for some time and it's no coincidence those things, uh, even old things like domain-driven design, have had a, a real resurgence and people are talking about them more. Um, and one of the things that I've been particularly interested in is uh, Conway's law. I won't, you know, you've all probably been Conwayed to death, but um, how we can use the social dynamics 
of organizations and teams to affect design or the implementation of systems and architectures. Um, while I was at ThoughtWorks, we talked about, and I coined the, the term, the inverse or reverse Conway maneuver. And then you, know, you unleash some good idea into the world and then you get beaten up at conferences for all the damage that it caused for several years afterwards. The, um, but the underlying kind of social dynamics that makes Conway's law a, a, a thing, um, I've developed in my head a, a way of thinking about that the, and applying that, talking about how it creates these stronger and weaker forces in, in organizations. So I'll dive a little bit into MYB, the company. I'm sure there's people in the room here who worked at MYB over the years. It's um, 30 years old when, in the year that I joined, 18 months ago or so. Um, I was in high school when MYB was uh, formed. I'm pretty sure half this room wasn't even in senior school. Um, so, so I was in high school. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you make me feel better. The, uh, you know, not many product companies that I've ever gone and worked with have this kind of heritage, this, this really long um, line of, of um, sort of household name software products. Um, really interesting thing to join. And when I stepped in, I sort of expected, I thought I had a picture of what MYB looked like on the inside, but, um, but it's actually like the TARDIS. You go inside, it's a lot bigger on the inside. There's a real breadth of products, um, things that uh, MYB has as discrete product offerings and uh, even things that we've bought more recently, even since I joined, um, that, are, that are coming together to form a thing we call the business management platform. And um, the idea is that we have a platform through which you can access a bunch of different services, including things that you use every day in what you um, do as a, as a customer, running your business. But I'm not going to need to talk too much about the business strategy of MyB, but what it means is for technology is that we have to a lot more work that cuts across the organization rather than selling individual products. A little bit of context as to where we are. Now MYOB, for many years, the evidence is there, was like a lot of product companies, the, from a tech governance point of view, was right over on the left in this world of where the software developers and engineering teams were, were like, I do what I want. I want autonomy. I want to be able to choose my own technology stacks. I want to be able to, to, to use the, the, the cloud services and API gateways and formats and things that I want. Uh, whereas a lot of the companies I was consulting to over that time was right over on the right, like banks and insurance companies. You do exactly what's in the book. Do it one way. We all want conformance. Um, and the, being able to do that, that kind of auto, full autonomy thing was mostly appropriate when we built these kind of independent products uh, uh, and we wanted to, to, to grow our individual products. But when we want to create this more integrated experience and connect them all together, it creates, it just adds to the friction and so, uh, and the waste. So we want to pull a little bit to the right. We don't go all the way to, to the, the hellhole of you know, no innovation and, and, um, and staying within the rules, but you need to shift a little bit to the right. And a lot of organizations, I think, are going through something similar. But the question's always, where do you apply that standardization? Where do you, um, you, know, where do you prioritize applying standards and rules, and where do you allow for the freedoms? Um, and so, that's part of the, the art of this problem. Uh, to tell a bit more of this story, I need to unpack the, the building of MYB and so sort of talk a little bit about um, the, the structure and the internal organizing constructs that we use. Um, now, the first one uh, is uh, what we call a, a domain. And no, no kind of prizes for guessing why it's called a domain. Uh, domain is our building block of capability in the organization. So a domain represents like a, like a domain-driven design domain. It's, it's a consistent data model, but it also represents some data, processes and process definitions, the people and, and, uh, that, that both run and potentially use the, the capability that it provides and offer that capability. Um, systems and user interfaces and all the things that are the, the, there, that's, we, we consider that to be within that domain boundary. Now, 
it looks really nice. Not all of our domains are neatly independent like this. I'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Now, our domains are grouped together. You need another grouping structure to be able to make sense of the world. And, the, and one of the key um, grouping structures bigger than that is the what we call a vertical. Our product capabilities, our product domains, are grouped together into what we call product verticals at Servicer, a particular customer group. So domain, vertical, and then if you zoom out again, you can see that we actually we have these three main tiers of those domains. So it's the, the, the product tier, the things that we sell that the customers use as part of the business management platform, the middle tier, which is our the way we run our own business and support our customers, being able to sell and buy the product and get a bill, and then the technology uh, layer underneath, which is our data platforms and our you know, hosting platforms, observability, things like that. So, um, and if you kind of zoom out again, you've got yeah, the, the, the product uh, and the platform that we build upon. So they're the, they're the big abstract concepts and how we arrange things. Um, in reality, it's not quite like that. You know, everything's a little bit blurry and the edges are a little bit, you know, and there's systems that cross over boundaries and things like that. But because I'm an architect and I've got an architect in my title, um, I see everything as nice, neat, kind of crisp boxes. Uh, that's the reality. Now, because it's 2023 and we've, we believe in, you know, you build it, you run it, you, you're aligning our teams, the long-live teams, to own, like to plan, build, and run uh, our systems and capabilities, we align or assign our teams to run those domains. So you get this mirroring between our organizational structure and the, the domain structure, um, which is pretty common, I think, in, in, in modern organizations, but quite different to when I started in my career. Um, so, that was all about me explaining some of those constructs so I can use those words. We've developed our little ubiquitous language in our domain of this talk, uh, and I can keep talking about the forces. Now, the strong and weak forces. Now, within a team, people sit together every day, and they'll go to stand up and they'll talk. These days it's on Teams or, or Zoom, but you know, we used to actually sit around and, and, and eat lunch together. Um, we can get really quick feedback together. We're often working together on the same problem, you know, pairing on solving an outcome, um, you know, you're working together essentially on a single task. So we have a very, very strong, we're part of the one team, we have a very, very strong force of alignment, very simple kind of, uh, it's, it's easy to resolve differences, it's easy to work together. Uh, multiple teams within a domain, assigned to a domain, um, usually that's still a very strong force. Usually under a common leadership, engineering managers, you know, working in the same space, working in the similar domains, so a common domain model, concepts, processes, language, talking to the same experts, shared rituals, close feedback loops. So still very strong uh, in terms of that um, force of alignment. As you zoom out, now we have multiple domains that are working in one of our verticals or in one of our platform areas. Much harder to get aligned in terms of delivery, like scheduling, coordination. You did this bit, that bit's now got to wait for this other bit to be connected together. It's harder to get people together to work on the same thing. You often have to coordinate and negotiate when you need to make changes. So, so further out, you get a much, much weaker force. And at the scale of, that's not mine, is it? No, good. At the scale of uh, all of MYB and then going out into our partner ecosystem and, the, and our um, more close partners and acquisitions, like that is the weakest force. You know, um, this is you know, getting into, into the several hundreds of people um, uh, all operating at a reasonably different, uh, uh, kind of cadences and rituals and how they work and systems of work. And, and so those feedback loops get slower and slower and the, the cost of coordinating is very, it becomes even higher in a world where we don't have, um, you know, we don't shift the people to the work, but the work is living in these long lived domains. So from left to right, we have the, 
um, the strong forces within a team and as you move out and you see uh, the organization uh, further and further apart, you get these weaker um, bonds and, and attractive forces, forces of alignment. So, so what? Yeah, like that's very interesting. Um, but how do we apply it? And a little bit about what I talked before about uh, where to apply standardization and where to be strict and where to be loose um, is, is really key. Now, connecting systems is something we do a lot of. You know, APIs, events, pipelines, data feeds, data pipelines. Um, you know, this is a very common thing for us to do, systems integration. Uh, now, within a domain, we talk about uh, being very loose in the way that we connect together systems. We actually see that uh, being able to connect together systems in uh, without enormous amounts of rigor actually allows for this kind of productivity because you're essentially implementing both sides of any interaction. It's productive coupling. It helps you move faster. Um, and, and adding additional kind of rigor can be wasteful. Whereas when you zoom out and you say we need to connect together multiple domains in our, in, within MYAB or even particularly where it crosses multiple parts of the organization, those verticals and platforms, um, that the, um, we need to, to have a much higher bar in terms of rigor. We have standardized APIs, we're moving towards like clear, you know, uh, more standardized formats for documentation, version management, deprecation, those sort of things. And when you get out to the whole of MYAB, um, we're, we're essentially saying if you stand up an API and it's being used broadly within the organization, you've now created a contract and you need to fulfill that forever. So we need to make sure that that's, that really has a high bar in terms of um, in how it's exposed to the, to the world, exposed to, the, to MIB. If you go outside to our public API, it has an even slower deprecation cycle. So we have that, that much, much weaker force. It's much harder to coordinate the changes required to get everybody to, to, to upgrade their, consume, their API consumers. So again, that same thing. Sort of at the domain level, we have a strong force so we can be weaker in terms of our standardization. The further we go out to the, the, the domain APIs and public APIs, we need to counteract. Another thing we do a lot is we have to make decisions. You know, thinking about architectural decisions and design decisions. And sometimes it's just not clear, who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to talk to around here to make this decision? Am I, am I allowed to make this decision? Um, you know, and so some people take too long. They spend a lot of time going around the business trying to find someone who'll say yes or, um, uh, and, and own up that they, they're the responsible person uh, for decisions that are actually quite trivial. Or sometimes people make decisions that, are, uh, that are actually have a lot of consequence, but they're not aware, and so they, um, they make that decision without consulting more widely. Um, and so um, we kind of overinvest in some areas, underinvest in others. This is, it might be no, no worse in my experience and possibly better than many places I've worked in the past, but um, clarity of decision making is really, really hard. So we've been gently introducing this idea that, that decisions have a scale. Now, you've all heard of like daisies and races and decision for, uh, uh, systems that allow you to do this, but what we've added is what is the blast radius of your decision? And uh, type A is where the impact is largely within your teams, within your domain, maybe a couple of small um, impacted parties. And the um, type B is like, okay, you know, it's, it's bigger, it's going to require a lot more coordination. If it, you know, the, the cost of getting this wrong or reversing, it's going to be higher. And type C is like, you know, we're, if we change this or we make this direction, it's going to impact everybody eventually. Um, and it's guiding our teams to, to, to how far do they need to consult, which forums they need to talk to. Um, who's the tiebreaker? You know, for a type C decision, you know, that's me uh, or my boss, Darren. And, and kind of, if the, if the decision isn't clear, you know, I'll, I'll intervene on a type C. Type A's and B's will probably be fine, just, just work it out. And so trying to give that guidance that says, not all decisions are equal, some uh, you, can, you can make on your own. So yeah, those type A decisions, cheap, low risk, go ahead, reversible. Um, type C, expensive, high risk, let's take some time, let's invest properly in, in, in kicking this around for a little bit. And the, um, 
The hard part, some, sometimes you know, one of the hard parts here is knowing when this decision has those sort of consequences. And that really relies on a lot of kind of that network effect of coaching and, and things like that to inform those kind of decisions, be there at the right time. But ultimately we're telling people, you know, escalate quickly, if, you know, make it a C if you're not sure, that kind of thing. Now, at those weak forces that are at our whole of organisation, they have an impact. They slow us down regardless, even if you know, we can harness them for certain things, we can, but, but those weak forces you know, are a reason why sometimes we end up with more complexity than we want. People head off in a different direction because they're not, they're not um, as connected to the whole of the organisation. Um, they, they, work, they make decisions in their local area that, that make sense in isolation, away they go. Um, so we do deliberately want to compensate for those weak, weak forces and add some things to our way of working that helps us uh, counteract those effects. One of the things we do um, is, which I know a number of organisations do, is that we produce an internal um, technology radar. Um, the, the tech radar at MIB, we're on our edition four. Um, I said earlier I had the opportunity to work with ThoughtWorks for many years on, on the public technology radar, um, and I get to, to help with our own internal radar. And it, what we do is we bring together a group of people that represent all of our different product verticals and platform areas. It's a, it's a group of about 18 to 20, I think. Um, Assad, who's sitting here somewhere, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a member of our Tech Radar Advisor Group, uh, and it's a process of going out and, and asking people in MIB what technologies are they interested in working with, uh, what, are they, what are they actually um, doing some, some experiments with, what are we seeing value with, and trying to surface that up so that we can have our little experience reports that come together as part of that tech radar process, and we push that back out to the organisation. And this is saying that, that our, our organisation as a whole has an opinion, not just this area has an opinion, but actually this is, a, this is the MYOB position on, on particular technologies. And so far, I think that's been quite an engaging process, uh, and people recognise that as something that's MYOB wide as opposed to kind of the technologies we use in a particular area. And in addition to that, we also publish uh, a set of um, what we call the MIB technology defaults. It's part of that same radar process. We uh, publish these essentially as the starting point when choosing um, technology at MIB. The, um, they, these things have, we've, we've worked through and said these are proven to work well. This is essentially the adopt ring of our radar plus plus. Um, not only do we think they work really well for MYOB, um, they, we've invested heavily to make them even easier to adopt through our, our platform investment. Uh, this isn't the whole set, it's just a little bit of an illustration of what they are. They, they cover everything from cloud platforms to, to our internal UI frameworks, um, build systems, a lot of delivery infrastructure, languages, um, and, and significant frameworks. The, the defaults are, are like considered our no regrets kind of options, for and, and um, but they still will evolve. And so with each round of the tech radar, we'll be looking at these. Um, we haven't made any major changes yet because you don't expect our defaults to change very often. Um, but this is in a way a really good answer for people who come to the organisation to say, well, what kind of tech company are we? What stacks do we use? We'll start from here. This is this is what we use. We've also um, developed uh, an engineering handbook, an internal engineering handbook. It's not, it's not a sort of externally facing kind of um, marketing piece for, for what engineering looks like at MYB. Um, we're developing this internally to essentially, again, counteract that weak force. So for people at MYB, here are the things that we do universally at MYB. And, and so sum it up as how do we do technology? So we want to shortcut any kind of confusion with all of our co common definitions and how we name things. Um, I want to speed up decisions with kind of prepackaged guidance that's published internally that, that says, you know, here, are, here are the things we favour, the principles the, and the guidance. Uh, 
and something that was really important, like I said before, we, MYB had been very kind of uh, separate in the way that we ran technology. Um, it needs to be trustworthy because you know, um, it's easy to publish something and for it just to be buried and for people to think, oh, that just, that's the opinion of those people over there in that other division, that other vertical. Um, so we actually build it in, in, in public, in open source internally, internal, internal open source, uh, with the chapters being developed by a group and they do PRs and we have a community discussions about the, the, the content. So currently it covers things like core software delivery practices, you know, uh, test-driven development, refactoring, uh, security practices like um, secrets management, threat modeling, and, and, and things like that. And, and some um, uh, development of some common engineering standards that cover like absolutely you must do these things uh, in any area of MYB. Um, so it's been um, really great at, at engaging the whole community in a conversation. And another, a uh, thing that we do to try to uh, bolster, you know, counteract those weak forces is, you know, I personally spend a lot of my life energy on this, is to develop um, the internal community, so practice and connections in the organisation. Uh, something I observed coming from a consulting background and coming into a product company uh, as a permanent uh, member of uh, the leadership team is how much information travels up and down in the organisation. Uh, which I'd observed before in clients, and how it can be harder for, for communication sideways. You know, just if you don't have those strong bonds. Um, and so um, our communities of practice around engineering, um, uh, reliability engineering, our future makers talks, a lot of those things are around creating um, that, that east-west uh, connection between people and, and bolstering that, just to shorten that, that time frame, develop the empathy. So, um, a lot of fun. I'll dive quickly into the hard bits. And I've talked about domains and I've talked about arranging our people around that. Um, the first most obvious thing is not all of our systems, in fact, some of our biggest and most valuable systems don't match that domain model. They cut across it. And uh, they're not neatly modular along the, the, the way we, we want these things to be. And reality is that that's probably not going away. The, um, some of them are quite stable and uh, the impact of that isn't, very, isn't particularly high and, and so we, we live with that. Some of them do need to change and we need to, to create more uh, partitioning and modularity that, that matches our domain model to allow that independence. But, and some of the, the big um, things we use uh, we, we make use of uh, internally, like SaaS platforms, things like Salesforce and others, they don't, they don't cut themselves up according to a domain model. They, they, they like to be big and monolithic. Um, so those system boundaries don't, don't match at all. We need to just recognize that and work with that as a constraint. Um, but it definitely creates a little bit of tension with the way we run our organization, the way we want to be able to, to make decisions locally within a domain. And because some of our systems cross uh, boundaries and because sometimes our, our uh, demand is uneven, like as in we've, we, one domain wants to get something done but it doesn't match the priorities of another domain, uh, the, to get things done, there are times where you need to make contribution that goes across boundaries. You want to get to an outcome, I'm going to need to make a, a change in a system that belongs to someone else. Um, we have you know, all the good things with kind of our the, the usual ability to make uh, pull requests and we, uh, we can um, access the code that belongs to another team and you can check it out and run it and, and um, you know, contribute those changes. Um, but it's definitely not easy. This is a really, really hard thing to do. I've, I've seen, a, I've talked to a lot of people who believe that this in, like in, inner sourcing, internal open source is like a panacea. It's like, this fixes everything. I'm really, really skeptical. Um, uh, and you know, maybe it's the organizations I've been in, but often the, the system you're trying to contribute into is run by a different team, built in a different way, has a different, has a quite complex internal domain model of its own, um, you know, and, and, and system model and ways, way of working, way of deploying, you know, because we allow for a level of divergence between our domains. And um, uh, so making those contributions is actually hard and it creates these really weird team dynamics where 
I'm, I'm trying to make this change to your system. I don't really know what I'm doing. Can you help me? And they're like, well, I'm too busy to do that. I'm doing my work, but I'll help a little bit because I've got some time. And the, then the, the team, um, you, know, you can create this kind of weird tensions between teams, which even just makes people even further apart, um, weakens those bonds even further. I, I drew this a while ago. I'm sorry, I didn't really redraw it for this, but I drew it for a, a conversation internally. But um, I think that if you're going to be able, if you're, you're enabling that inner sourcing, you're able to make contribution to other people's teams, you need to sort of stay within a healthy contribution pyramid. It's like, it's a weird way of saying it, but you, know, you want 70% of your work at least to be working on systems that you feel ownership of. You, you know, you're responsible for them. You're going to be on call if it goes bump in the night and because of your change, um, your, um, you own the, your own or heavily contribute to the technical direction. You can help make decisions. It's kind of like healthy to be able to, to own things and, and the work that you're doing is contributing to that. We do talk about being able to change neighbors systems, which is things that are within the same neighborhood in our world. It may be one of those product verticals and a nearby domain. And you want really little, very little of the work you do to be changing the core of you know, a, a system that belongs to a distant kind of part of the organization. What, what some of our teams um, have found themselves in because of the nature of some of our systems is that it's, this pyramid is inverted. Uh, and the, they're spending a lot of time, big chunk of their time, um, big chunk of their time, the top, uh, changing systems that belong to someone else. And uh, I would like to m improve this way of working, this system of build or deployment, but I don't own the system, I'm just contributing code. And we've had to act to sort of like correct that, um, to make that, to make that more healthy. And the, the last kind of uh, most obvious and most kind of common thing I bump into in MIB, but also elsewhere, is that we're dealing with a, a dynamic system. And people often say, well, how often do domains change? And what, you know, um, you know, why, um, how do you decide on the boundary of domain? What are you, kind of all, all that sort of stuff. And, and the uh, reality is, you know, we're a little bit um, on the journey here. There's still some parts of our organisation where you would say that, that people would say the domains change every every fortnight, and you know, every six months or every twelve months, and the teams are actually the stable um, element of our model. And that's the that to me is the the wrong way around. We need those domains to be really nice and stable. We we build accounting software and, a, and, and link it into a, a business management platform. It, the concepts and the domain concepts aren't radically changing from year to year. And so what I'm saying is that the, the domains aren't changing, we're actually changing our focus. And that's, that's creating this kind of want to split these apart, snip, snip, or paste them together and, and create new structures. Um, and, um, and that's affecting that long-term uh, benefit that we're looking for, having stability and having something to anchor our knowledge and our system boundaries and kind of our APIs and everything too. So, um, you know, where that's happening, um, we're working to try to to find out why and, and whether um, we can try to help create that more stable capability aligned domains that are, that are stable. Um, sometimes it's because our our uh, strategy and priorities change. And, and so we need to move people capacity from some domains to others to, to you know, build effectively new features or overhaul new things. And, um, and that's reality, that's, that always happens. Um, but at the moment, uh, occasionally that means that we, we think that we're changing, we're just moving people, but we're actually changing the domain boundaries. So something to, something to work on. Um, So I'm coming to the end of the, the, the talky talky bit. There's a couple of kind of things that I wanted to, to highlight. And, and the first one was about that tech governance thing, that, that like where do you standardize? And absolutely one size fits all. I've only ever seen kind of cause more constraints. We want to en enable that speed and innovation. We want to enable it in the right place. So 
we've established these long-lived domains. We want them to be to be nice and stable. They allow us to consolidate that the kind of like our capability, like and, and give people license to to simplify and and they we anchor that that ownership, the how they make design choices and how they build our tech roadmap, and how they govern the technology, um, that, that's linked to that domain structure. So it's very domain driven. And overall, we need to compensate for the weak forces that happen in any organization at scale. So push some standardization at the right places um, and, and you know, right through to, to documenting exactly the standards you, you follow, but at, at the right level. Uh, and strengthen the networks that, um, that you have to, to compensate for those weak forces. And that's it. We have some time for some questions. Evan, would you be interested in answering some? Not with that voice. Ah, oh, there we are. Um, hi, thanks for that. I just wanted to ask, what are your main metrics for deciding whether this is working, what needs to change, and things like that? So I imagine with, a, with your you know, complete autonomy to you know, um, shift right graph from earlier, you will get some pushback from developers who were used to doing their own thing their own way all the time. Um, so it couldn't just be employee satisfaction. So what do you measure your success by on this? Um, my, yeah, probably one of the big ones is how, you know, how, uh, like just patience. It's gonna take a long time. Uh, engaging people in the why. Um, I, I don't have a great answer for, for metrics. We do capture a lot of delivery metrics that we want to see, uh, see improve. It's hard to, to see the causality of specific things we're doing in the standardization efforts and, the, and those things. Engagement of people. And um, you know, when, you, um, when we do the internal you know, talks about um, the tech radar, for example, or the codex, and see how many people in the organization turn up to those and engage like more in terms of um, uh, you know, challenging ideas or contributing um, back. I think in the codex we're still kind of, that's a journey, we're still a little bit early in terms of penetration. Um, but the, you know, we've got plans to, to kind of grow that as it, as it gets more comprehensive as well. Um, there, there's some of, the, some of the key things that I see. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, yeah, one area I was interested in, uh, you mentioned the type A, B, C uh, decision that could be made and I guess that, that made me think within the strong force of the team, there's, there could be a bit of confidence that, that may bias. So I might make a decision because I'm in the team because I have good communication with my other team members that this is definitely a low risk change and they agree in consensus. But in fact, uh, it just so happens that you know there's a data point there that goes to out to a report that ends up breaking the CEO's daily report or something like that, and it's actually a, a type B. Have you sort of found that ever? Yeah, I mean, the, this this decision framework is not widely used yet at MIB, so I can't give you many experience reports for this. We use it a bit, um, but but from my my other experience, not having any framework at all means that you're going to do those things all the time. Uh, having a framework that you can hang examples of, uh, that you can kind of highlight and talk about those things is, is, um, is really helpful. I think just because examples help people go build their sense of network to say actually, no, this is an example, this, this is similar to this other thing we did and, and that was a type B, so maybe this is a type B. Uh, or um, the other thing is to, to look at um, uh, post-mortems on implementation and see where decisions, how, how decisions happen that maybe had an impact. Uh, and being quite transparent and public about that. Um, bluntly, I think we've still got a ways to go on that, but, uh, but that's definitely helped train people's sort of senses. Um, the other is that we, um, no one should be doing these, making these decisions on their own all the time. Like, sure, at a, at a team level, you know, you're gonna be supported by a tech lead you know, in, in the team or a senior developer who's, who's got some experience. And then those, some of those decisions might, you know, they, they might slip under the radar. But beyond that, you'll also, we, we sort of have a supporting structure for each level of the organization. Domains have engineering managers and are supported by an architect across the vertical, that kind of, kind of thing. So, and, and those roles are intended to um, 
and, and in reality are well set up to, as a supportive and coaching role as opposed to a I tell you what to do, um, I, I set the rules um, kind of thing so that people should feel more comfortable having those conversations. If you can create a safe to, safe to talk about this thing environment, then you're more likely to surface the, hang on, have you thought about that? As opposed to, um, to funneling it through an approval board. Uh, the kind of other elements of our decision-making process that I'm pushing hard on and are already inherent in the way we work at MIB um, are that we, we want to share decisions looking not for approval, but we're actually trying to seek dissent is where I sort of talk about it. It's like, tell me why it won't work. I'm not asking you to approve it. I just want you to, to, to use your experience to tell me why it won't work. John Allspore, but you know, wrote about this probably a decade ago and it really hasn't changed fundamentally. If you, if you talk about approval boards, then you'll get less, less input. If you, than you do if you talk about just opening up the conversation.